Well, good morning. Welcome to Copernic, or at least our Copernic's live stream. And uh, glad you could be joining us this morning for the anticipated launch of the uh, Perseverance uh, rover, the next mission to Mars. Uh, we are going to very quickly move to uh, the, the NASA feed, and um, we'll, which is already uh, sort of in process here, and uh, we'll uh, occasionally chime in as, uh, as time goes on here. Um, so actually, let's just do that. Let's just go right to, uh, to the NASA feed. So uh, thanks for joining us. Hope uh, you're enjoying your breakfast. I've got my, uh, I got my coffee here. And uh, this is a, a great way to uh, watch an exciting moment. So uh, we'll see you in a bit. Not only do we want to study them now, today, with those state-of-the-art instruments and facilities, we can preserve actually most of the sample for decades, and that will allow us to use uh, future instruments that haven't even been invented yet, or you know, answer questions we haven't even thought of yet. So that's it's really important to get those samples back here. And awesome. could we confirm life if it, if it is there with the instruments we have on the rover, or would that ha actually, actually happen back on Earth? I fully expect we won't be able to make that real determination until they're back here on Earth. We expect with the instruments we have on board to be able to detect biosignatures and the types of things that say, yes, this is a sample that may contain evidence of past life in the sample, mm -hmm. but I think it would be very difficult to confirm that until we actually get the samples back here on Earth. Speaking of getting them back here to Earth, <laughs> the, the key part of this, how will you do that? That's a great question. <laughs> We're already starting work on that next mission called Mars Sample Return. We think it's going to launch. We're planning for a launch in 2026. This is a really complex mission. It's going to require two launches from Earth and one launch from Mars in order to get those samples back here. Wow. We're working really closely with the European Space Agency, our core partners on this mission. So we'll have a launch from the US, which will launch a, launch a sample return lander that will land on the surface carrying a fetch rover that will go out and pick up the samples, bring them back, load them into a rocket, the Mars Ascent Vehicle, and launch them into orbit around Mars. At the same time, when we launched from Earth, the Europeans are also launching an orbiter from Earth that will be in orbit around wow. Mars, and it will capture those samples with that orbiter. We're going to capture them, and then it will make its return trip back to Earth, release them, and they'll come down and land in the Utah desert, where we will then safely carry them and put them in the curation facility. Wow, what a process. Awesome, yeah. that is so amazing. Thank you so much, Lori, for joining us today. We appreciate My your pleasure. time. Enjoy the launch. Get a I'm view. Gonna, yeah, go <laughs> Perseverance, go Ingenuity. Awesome. Thank you, Lori. Well, in the early 1900s, the Wright brothers proved powered flight was possible on Earth. Now, NASA plans to test a powered flight on Mars with an ingenious helicopter. So, let's get back out to California now and Raquel. The Martian atmosphere is 99% less dense than here on Earth, so this is no easy task to fly on Mars. It is sterile. Now, hitching a ride on the Perseverance rover is an exciting technology demonstration. The Mars Ingenuity helicopter. Now, if successful, it would mark the first time humans have taken powered flight on another planet. Ingenuity's project manager, Mimi Ung, joins us now to talk about the set of milestones Ingenuity needs to hit in order to take flight on Mars. Hi, by the way, we just had an earthquake in this room. But anyway, with that, um, Mars helicopter tech demo is motivated by the potential of adding the aerial dimension to space exploration. In the future, a helicopter can serve as a scout for rovers and astronauts. A helicopter can get us to places of high scientific interest that cannot be reached today. It's not easy to build a rotorcraft for flight at Mars. The atmosphere there is very thin, about 1% compared to that at Earth. So a helicopter for Mars has to be very light and have a rotor system that can spin very fast. Behind me is the full-scale model of Mars helicopter Ingenuity. It's very light, 1.8 kilograms, about four pounds. It's capable of flying through the thin atmosphere of Mars and is capable of surviving and operating autonomously. There is a set of milestones between now and Ingenuity's first flight. The very first one is when we turn on the helicopter and the base station to check their health. 
first time operating in true space environment. The next major milestone will be when Perseverance rover deploys Ingenuity helicopter to the surface. The deployment will also mark the first moment the helicopter starts to work on its own in a standalone manner. It will never return to the rover. And the first major stone, milestone then will be the helicopter surviving the first cold Martian night, about minus, degree, minus 90 degrees Celsius. And we have designed the helicopter to keep itself warm. So we've planned for up to five flights in the 30 Martian days that have been set aside for our flight experiments. The flight data we get from the helicopter will inform our team the health of the helicopter and performance of each flight. The data could also include a few color photos. First ever photos of Martian terrain taken from aerial vantage. That would be true icing on our cake. Cake Mimi, thank you. And you're right, we did have a little bit of a shakeup, but everything seems to be okay right here so far. And we look forward to Ingenuity's first flight. And with that, let's head back to KSC as we continue the countdown to Mars. All right, thank you, Raquel. When the name Perseverance was chosen for the rover, our country was in the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, the name is also a fitting description of what NASA teams needed to get this rover to the pad on time. Joining us now is NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Thank you very much for being here, Jim. Uh, perseverance is meaning a lot, and that includes a recently a 3.9 earthquake that we have reports of in California. <laughs> yeah. We just saw our own Mimi Ung. She said things were rattling there. So we are persevering a lot. <laughs> good thing we're not launching from Vandenberg today. And so you're absolutely <laughs> right about that. Things looking good here in Florida. I want to ask you, why did we choose, why did you choose to move NASA forward on this launch in the midst of a global pandemic? Oh, well, there's a number of reasons, but I think the biggest thing is, uh, you know, the public wants to see the United States of America and our international partners do stunning things. And we, we have a history of doing amazing things in the most challenging times. And this is, this is no different. Um, so, so look, here's the, here's the other challenging thing with Mars in general. You know, we can only go to Mars once every 26 months when, <laughs> when literally the planets are aligned. And, um, and if we miss this launch window, you know, it would cost us half a billion dollars to store this vehicle oh, wow. for the next two years. Um, and so there's a lot of reasons to go forward. Some of it is, you know, financial, uh, you know, the, the NASA budget, um, you know, and, and then the other, the other big reason is Americans want to see us continue to do big things. I want to be really clear, though. Uh, we have made sure that all along this process, if somebody didn't feel comfortable working on this project, they had the option to not work on this project. Um, and, and, and I will tell you, we didn't find that very often, if at all. Mm -hmm. um, I, will, I will also say that our, our highest priority were, was, was the safety of our people. And we wanted them to know that if they come to work, they're going to be safer at work than they would be if they stayed at home. Um, and, and of course, the, 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 the personal protective equipment, the social distance, distancing, the changing of schedules in order to minimize people uh, working on the vehicle at one time, all of these things were put into place as protective measures. But it is true, um, the name Perseverance, which was given to this robot by Alex Mather, who's a seventh grader in Virginia, mm -hmm. um, this is all about perseverance. And going to Mars, as you said, going to Mars is all about persevering in general. Doing it now is more persevering than ever before. Real quick, we're, we've got a launch, of course, counting down. How are you feeling? Uh, well, nervous as always. This is a, a lot of money at the top of a rocket. And of course, not just the money, but uh, the, the entire life's work of so many, you know, thousands of people. So um, look, it's, uh, it's going to be a good day. We're knocking on wood. Uh, but it's but it's going to be a good day for NASA. Thank you very much for being here, Jim. Appreciate always. your leadership. Thank you. you bet. All right. Thank you so much. We are now at L minus 14 minutes and counting. Let's check back in with Joshua and Mick, get an update on preparations to launch the rocket. Joshua, there's an important poll by the Launch Surfaces program happening soon, right? Yes, absolutely. So the, the countdown is continuing. Um, obviously, a status report, we heard them talking about the earthquake, and everything <laughs> is still good. Um, we're hearing that on the back end that things are proceeding well. No. No major issues or hiccups because of that. Um, other, everything going well. The savvy viewers out there will notice the clocks in motion. Two clocks, actually. The countdown clock there behind Daryl and Moo is, is at four minutes and holding. Excuse me, at T minus four minutes and holding. Uh, but the clock on your screen now is the L clock, and that is continuing to count down towards that 7.50 AM liftoff time.
Yeah, that's exactly right, Josh. The, as we talked earlier, the L time is the real time clock that continues to count down to zero. At T minus four and counting, the two clocks, the T clock and the L clock, will sync up as the team continues to work their operational sequence events and the procedure. So the team is very focused this morning. Uh, as you already mentioned, the uh, earthquake that was brought up, the team has assessed that and looked at it, and they're doing a great job in, in getting us to zero this morning. So we mentioned the U.S. Space Force as one of the five teams earlier, and next up we have the NASA Launch Services Program team responsible for managing the launch. And we're going to hear a poll here from the NASA launch manager uh, himself, Omar Baez. He's going to poll his team for their readiness to be able to report out in just a few minutes. So he's very punctual, so this should be coming uh, right on time here in just a few seconds. Let's listen in now. This is the NLM on the NLM net. Uh, currently working, uh, no issues on the range or the launch vehicle. Weather is uh, green, 10% chance of uh, violation. And uh, winds aloft look good for the entire window. Um, the uh, spacecraft did uh, experience some earthquake activity at their uh, control center in Pasadena, but appears to be ready to proceed. And with that, I would like to pull the team for final launch poll and spacecraft configuration. NASA CE. NASA CE is go. SMA. SMA is go. SMD. SMD is go. NASA Mission Manager. NASA Mission Manager is go. LSP. LSP is go. Copy. NASA team is ready to proceed. All right, so we heard NASA team is ready to proceed. Um, he even mentioned the weather in there, which is great, only a 10% chance of violation. Uh, again, a big thank you to Jessica Williams of the U.S. Space Force, 45th Space Wing. I, I like the fact that we're working no issues this morning <laughs> into this count. That's an important part that Omar brought up. And uh, the team, you know, one, one thing you need to understand about the NLM is it's a combined NASA team of spacecraft and engineering. So hearing all those goes is good this morning. Yep, and we're going to keep moving because we've got a lot to do still. We're going to throw it back out to you, Daryl. All right, thank you very much, Joshua. Our NASA teams across the country overcame challenges caused by the COVID-19 outbreak, as you've heard so far, to get this Mars rover to the launch pad on time. We are about to hear from workers at centers in California and Florida who took every imaginable precaution while managing to get this vital work done. When I saw the country shutting down, I thought for sure there is no way we're going to be able to continue this. It's something that nobody expected. It's something nobody could plan for. Rather than your first priority being mission success and, and getting to the launch pad, your first priority immediately gets displaced and it's now the safety of the people. I was seriously thinking Mars would be Mars 2022. It took a lot of work to put stuff together in order to keep momentum going, to keep people working safely, keep them healthy, and to keep the project uh, on schedule. There's no doubt that working in isolation, not virtual isolation, but in physical isolation from everyone else, is a challenge. It's hard for me. I have two young kids. Sometimes I, I'm not able to focus or listen probably as well as I would want to. A lot of our work was occurring in a clean room anyways, but that meant that even before we entered the clean room, we had to find ways of ensuring that uh, we were not putting ourselves or others at risk. Most of the time for these missions, our relation with the spacecraft customer is incredibly important. So usually we're able to be here working beside them on their equipment and making sure that all of their needs are covered even before they ask for it. It, it is a challenge, but we're used to meeting unique requirements here at the hangar and we pride ourselves in our flexibility. This is just another mission just with a different set of obstacles that we have to overcome. It might not be, you know, like a broken rocket, but it's... <laughs> It's got its own challenges. Our job is to go into the unknown. And this is just another example of the unknown. How to make this job happen when you're doing it largely through a computer screen. I asked the team a couple months ago if they would like to do something to kind of symbolize and mark these challenges that we faced. And they designed something that we called a COVID-19 perseverance plate. It's now affixed to the port side of the rover. It has a globe 
representing all of us that face this challenge together, the spacecraft leaving uh, the Earth on its way to Mars, and all of this supported by the now familiar staff and servant of the medical community. And we hope that this mission, in some small way, can inspire them in return. Pretty much everybody that I've talked to that's associated with the mission has, has said the same thing, which is you could not have come up with a better name than Perseverance. We have persevered through this. Nobody's given up. We won't get this mission done. We will get it done through the pandemic. I think it now is, it's a really important symbol of humanity, hopefully persevering through this great challenging time that we have right now. We appreciate that team as well as the medical community that really stepped up and helped. And it's ironic, you know, Moo, because the name Perseverance was chosen by a seventh grader who at the time he submitted that name. He didn't know that we would be faced with a global pandemic. So we are glad to have him and his family here along with the student who named the helicopter to watch the launch in person. Their names are Alexander Mather and Veniza Rupani, and they are watching from the fifth floor balcony of our engineering building, just a stone's throw away from the countdown clock. Look at that, there they are, there they looking are. cool. Uh, Alexander Mather, who goes to Lake Braddock Element Secondary School in Burke, Virginia, submitted the winning essay to name our rover Perseverance. Yeah, they've got a great view. I've seen it from up there. They've got the VAB in the background, as you can see there. So, so cool. it's such a beautiful setup for this awesome launch. And Veniza, oh, you can see her in the wave. Hey guys, appreciate you. She's a junior at Tuscaloosa County High School in Northport, Alabama. She entered the contest as well and came up with the name Ingenuity for our helicopter that will accompany our rover to Mars. Thank you both for being here. What a neat view that is. Yes. All right, folks, with the coast phase coming up, we wanna let you know that after the launch, it will be about an hour before Mars Perseverance separates from the second stage when that and when that happens, the rover will then be on its way to Mars. So hang in there. Yeah, don't go away as we will walk you through the flight around the Earth and we'll talk live with the astronaut Zena Cardman about our human exploration ambitions and NASA's Associate Administrator of Science, Dr. Thomas Zerbuchen. It's going to be great, folks, so stick around. It's L minus six minutes and 26 seconds now. And time to focus our attention on the launch operation the rest of the way to lift off. So let's send it back out to Mick Woltman and Joshua Santora. Gentlemen. Thank you. I want to let you listen into the to the remainder of this poll in motion. Let's go to that now. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. LD is go and you have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. ALC verify T0 is set for 1150 Zulu. So 11.50 Zulu, that is 7.50 a.m. Eastern yes. time, uh, so that time is correct. As I'm uh, watching Josh do the yeah. calculations <laughs> on his finger there. Get my advocates out. Uh, right. No, so there's a lot to come ahead. Uh, one of the things coming up um, in just a, f a few Go seconds. Minus five minutes, 30 seconds. Oh, Go, start with... NSC. Go, NSC. Spacecraft on internal power and timer set for T0 of 11.50 Zulu. Roger. OS, start list data capture. Roger. Fantastic. All steps are complete prior to terminal count. LC switch is ready. Awesome. So things are really starting to pick up here. You're going to hear yes. more and more chatter on those nets there. That call was to say that Perseverance is powered and ready to go, which is a phenomenal call. Yeah, yeah a couple things happened during that time, right, is a uh, launch conductor, ULA's launch conductor, Scott Barney, pulled the whole ULA team. They were all go. We got to the hear third The third of our five teams. The third of our five teams. We got to hear the end of that where the range was clear to proceed, and uh, ULA's launch director, Bill Collin, gave the authority to uh, go for launch this morning at 7.50 a.m., then we got to hear from the the JPL spacecraft team that they are the on, fourth team the fourth team that they are on internal power and uh, timers are set. Uh, they are targeting a liftoff of 7:50 a.m. this morning. So all things are looking good for us, Joshua. This morning, it's so you know we talk about being nervous and excited. This is right here where we're nervous and excited. Yes, uh, there are a lot of things happening as we get ready to count down uh, to uh, the liftoff this morning. We have about 15 seconds left in this hold before we pick up the count. Yeah, we're going to listen into that. Uh, the fifth team, the one we haven't mentioned yet, is the Department of Energy, who is responsible for the MMRTG, the power source for Perseverance. Counting. Three, two, one, mark. 
Awesome. So this is now the terminal countdown. This is that time when things become more and more automated over the next couple of minutes, few minutes. And the, the energy is building, but the focus is increasing exponentially. Yeah, as Tori said during his interview, you know, the teams are very disciplined, very focused on what they're doing, the operational sequence of events that they're following. They are making sure everything happens, especially in this T minus four and counting uh, period, because there's a lot of things they have to do. They have to finish uh, topping the vehicle, make sure that all the tanks, uh, first stage, second stage on Centaur are at flight pressures and full of fuel ready to go for this morning. They have to make sure the FTS system is armed and uh, ready for personnel safety just in case uh, so that the range can do that. They have to check the uh, electrical and avionics systems. They have to make sure that the uh, flight computer has all the uh, information it needs to place Mars 2020 into the orbit it has to. So a lot of things going on. Exciting time for the team right now. But uh, again, staying focused and following that procedure they've got. Three minutes. As we look ahead to post liftoff, want to kind of preview for you what's going to happen because there's going to be a lot going on. You're not going to hear much from us. You'll actually be hearing from the ULA flight commentator, Jesse Gonzalez. Uh, he'll be kind of giving those calls past liftoff that will walk us through maximum dynamic pressure and into SRB separation and then into fairing separation, booster separation, and then the m first main engine ignition of the Centaur, Centaur yes. uh, RL-10. And so then you'll kind of hear us jump back in and help provide some more context to what's going on. Uh, we encourage you to stay with us for the rest of the show, though. There's a ton more content we have to bring you, and we are far from over. want to emphasize that the countdown to Mars is not done at zero today. The countdown to Mars ends in February, when Mars 2020 safely delivers perseverance and ingenuity to the surface of the red planet. So we're going to let you listen in now and enjoy the last couple minutes of the, the process of launching a rocket. One minute fifty nine. Vehicle internal. One minute fifty five. Launch sequencer start. One minute fifty. Securing Centaur LH two. Securing Centaur LO two. So there we heard the fueling is is One wrapping minute up. 40. There. Yep, fueling is wrapping launch up. Uh, team is gone. Launch enables done. Launch conductor sequence is ready to go. They're getting ready to turn the vehicle over to auto FPS sequence uh, at T minus 31 seconds. Um, so that's a big thing that they're getting done here. At uh, T minus 25 seconds, we will hear the team uh, give their final goes that everything is ready and One the launch 20. vehicle is uh, ready to lift OCU off and perform armed. this mission. SCS count started. One minute 15. Produce ACS for launch. Roger. One minute 10. Then valves locked. One minute. Rock report range status. Range green. That's good to hear, Joshua, right that there. Public safety there is accounted for, the FTS system. Uh, there you see on your screen a beautiful shot. Uh, the skies look great. There is little wind um, happening. You'd be able to see more of the, the venting. Um, if there were wind, the trail of that, of that venting. So uh, we're yeah. ready to go. And actually, that's an important seconds. point. The reason we don't see that Stable venting is the three. vent valves have been locked up to put flight pressure into the tanks. And as we just heard, they're stable at step three, which means the tanks are ready to go. And uh, here at about five seconds, we will hear seconds. the team ECS reduced for launch. Give the final go. 25 seconds. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. Go Mars 2020. And there we go. We are ready to go lift off this morning, Joshua. All right, let's get ready to start counting down. 10, 9, 8, eight 7, seven six, 6, 5, five, five 4, four three, 3, ignition, 2, two one, 1, 0. Go Perseverance. Off. As the countdown to Mars continues, the perseverance of humanity launching the next generation of robotic explorers to the red planet. Go, go, go. Oh, it's beautiful. And Atlas TU has gone to closed loop control. Right on time. Coming up on 30 seconds into flight, the RD-180 is throttling down as expected. Engine response looks good. And Mach 1, Atlas 5 is now supersonic. It's already passing And passing 45 now. seconds into flight, vehicle is now passing through max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. And 
Passing one minute into flight, the RD-180 is throttling back up as expected. Engine response looks good. At this time in flight, the SRV chamber pressures remain nominal. The RD-180 pump speed and fuel injector pressures are responding well to demands on the engine. Standing by for SRV burnout shortly. SRV solid rocket booster. The smaller rockets on the side. And we have burnout on all four SRBs. Burnout pressure signatures look good. Standing by for SRB jettison shortly. And we have a good indication of SRB jettison of all four SRBs. And the vehicle has gone to closed loop guidance. Vehicle body rates are responding nominally at this time. It's amazing. And coming up on two and a half minutes into flight, uh, the RD 180 is throttled down slightly as expected. Engine response continues to look good. At this time, miles. the vehicle is uh, 50 miles in altitude, uh, 85 miles downrange, traveling at 6,000 miles per hour. Uh, they said 50 miles of altitude, and yet the, and the uh, Centaur reaction control system is now pressurizing to flight levels. I think there's an issue because it says 188, 190 miles. That's almost as that's a, getting closer to where the ISS is. So. Not sure what's going on with that. And just past three minutes into flight, the RD-180 is now throttling hey, to maintain go. a constant two and a half G acceleration limit for payload fairing jettison. Engine response and vehicle acceleration look good. Okay, flat earthers, explain that uh, curve for me there. <laughs> and there's the fairing. And we have good indication of payload fairing jettison and Centaur forward, forward load reactor deck jettison. And the RD-180 is, throttled back, is throttling back up to attain a 4.6G acceleration. Uh, engine response continues to look good. And Centaur has begun the boost phase chill-down sequence to thermally condition the RL-10 for operation. Standing by for Biko shortly. Miko, main engine cut off. Biko is the... Biko is the call for booster engine. And we have Biko, booster engine cut off. Standing by for stage separation. Thanks for the ride. And we have good indication of Atlas Centaur separation. So there you're seeing live footage. And we from have the Mach rocket. one. Uh, RL10 operating parameters look good. Uh, <clears throat> chamber pressures are stable. This will be the first of two burns for today's mission. Uh, this first burn will pro be approximately seven minutes in length. So Mick, that's pretty exceptional footage there. That's live video. Uh, we will see that switch over shortly into an animation that kind of helps let us know what's happening with the rocket. But right there, uh, a beautiful liftoff. Uh, fun to feel that rumble in the building here as we proceed towards uh, orbit and then towards uh, Mars destination. Yeah, absolutely. It was great uh, watching an on-time liftoff of the Atlas V with that a little over 2 million uh, pounds of thrust. Uh, cleared the tower in roughly five seconds. Uh, Josh, you and I worked the InSight mission, and if you recall, that mission on the West Coast took about 17 yeah, seconds to get past the tower. So with those four control. solids today, this thing really got out of here and on its way. And it's, uh, as we hear from Jesse, 
everything's looking nominal and all uh, vehicle parameters are, are within the design limits and and we're getting ready to come up on a main engine start for that first burn that and Jesse was talking about the, uh, yeah so recapping RGS this countdown to Mars uh, uh, the stations firing. begin to be filled up this morning just after midnight uh, preparations fuelings powering up uh, all the way through that that liftoff that happened uh, I think Mick uh, it wasn't precisely on time I think you said it was like 10 milliseconds early um, so it's pretty much dead on yeah dead on this team does a great job as I said, they're very focused, very disciplined, as, as Tori also said, courageous. Uh, they have done a lot of work to get us to this point today uh, through this pandemic, changed how they did some of their work, uh, you know, made adjustments as needed, uh, a lot of cleaning, a lot of things, a lot of wearing their face masks, uh, doing all kinds of things. And so this is an exciting time, not only for the JPL team in Mars 2020, but everybody that's worked this mission and for the country and the agency. So this is exciting to see. We still have a long way to go, Joshua. Yes. Before spacecraft separation. Yeah, we had a really quiet countdown today, which is phenomenal uh, that we got off the ground on time. And we are proceeding now that we are in the middle of the first burn. Uh, it's tough to make out, but that engine is lit and it's firing. Um, so we are in motion. There you go. There's that animation we talked about. The telemetry there as we switch to a TDRS compatible data format. Uh, TDRS. Overall telemetry quality is uh, very good. The space tracking system. Um, so there you go. This is not an actual video, but this is an animation that's driven by real data. So although we're not actually seeing the engine on screen right now, uh, we can see that the engine is lit, and that is driven by the data that says that the engine is truly lit, and we're in this burn. Yeah, the launch vehicle continues to send telemetry to the launch team uh, via the TDRS network, uh, as you mentioned, uh, and that allows them to continue to watch what's going on and make sure all their sequence of events uh, meet their timeline. Uh, we continue on a nominal flight this morning. Um, this uh, this first burn, as we heard earlier, will be about six minutes. This will get us into that park orbit around Earth, allow us to get uh, on our way, and then get into that approximately 30-minute coast period that we're going to have. Eight minutes into flight, uh, beginning to see the Centaur PU system balance out uh, mass errors, um, seeing very stable body rates in the Centaur. Um, so we've mentioned five teams at play, and although if you were watching, hopefully you got a chance to see this in person, if not on camera, it's easy to kind of say, oh, it's over, like job done. But all five of these teams still very much engaged, still very much focused, because there's a lot of work ahead as we proceed through this first burn, and then a coast phase, like you mentioned, Mick, and then a second burn, and then spacecraft separation and the acquisition of signal from Mars 2020. Um, so Wow, that was quite an exciting launch. We're going to keep uh, the live stream going for at least uh, probably another 45 minutes or so just to uh, uh, keep you engaged. Uh, then at, the, at 8.45, we're going to actually have to uh, uh, terminate this live stream because our uh, summer camp uh, for Space and Stars for students who are entering um, uh, third and fourth grade will be uh, starting right at nine o'clock, so uh, we'll need to prepare for that. And we're using the same system for that uh, for the camp that we're using for this live stream. So uh, we'll get you back to the uh, NASA's, uh, NASA's program. Enjoy the rest of your, uh, your breakfast. I'm gonna keep working on my coffee. And uh, thanks again for joining us some, uh, th this, uh, this morning uh, for this exciting uh, uh, and so far successful launch. Thanks again for uh, tuning in to, uh, to Copernic. Football game, right, with a, a quarterback trying to throw a pass downfield. You need a quarterback with a lot of performance who can get that ball down there where it needs to be uh, and, and uh, so the receiver can ex intercept that, in our case, seven months later. There you go. Yeah, it's the longest football pass ever. Uh, the Earth is the quarterback. The Atlas is the quarterback's arm. Perseverance is the football. And Mars is the receiver. That's good. Uh, exactly right. And what we also talked about is that technically, uh, you could launch to Mars at any time if you had a rocket that was powerful enough. But this is the launch period every 26 months or so, as we've talked about, that makes the most sense because you require the least amount of energy to get to Mars uh, because it takes a lot to get there. Obviously, like the Atlas 541 is 
is a workhorse. Yeah, as Tor Tori said, it's their dominator. Right? There you go. Yeah. He, he, I love that name <laughs> for the Atlas V, uh, 541. But we heard uh, Jim Bridenstine, our NASA administrator, tell us that if we didn't make this launch period, we would be down for roughly 26 yeah, it's, months, it's right? tough. So the period started July 17th and went to, and goes to August 15th. Today, July 30th, was one of those launch opportunities that we had. We had a two-hour window, and within that window, we had several opportunities. 25, to to actually. Yeah. 25 opportunities. And we launched at the beginning of the window on our first opportunity uh, to get Mars 2020 uh, going yep. on its way. And, and that, you know, that sounds like a, a lot, and it is. The flight analysis group, both at JPL, LSP, and ULA, did a lot of work to pick out those target sets and figure out where we needed to be. So they've done a great job, and we'll see how this mission continues. So, Mick, tell us about the two burns required here, and we're actually coming up on the end of the first one. Uh, ultimately, a lot of people probably, and myself included at some point, just like, why wouldn't you just keep firing the engines? Just fire all the way through and get to Mars in one shot. So the first burn gets us into that park orbit we talked about. We, we've lifted off, we've left Earth, we've got into a park orbit around Earth right now. And while we're in that uh, park orbit, we will perform some maneuvers to kind of roll uh, Mars Perseverance and the Centaur and uh, coast during that time, uh, basically setting itself up looking at the sun and away from the sun to control the thermal environments that uh, are on Mars 2020 during this coast period. That coast period will allow us to coast around uh, into the position that we need so that we can have that second firing to get the velocity needed to head off into Mars. Yes, and we will be back for that second burn in just under 30 minutes now. Uh, but for now, there's more to learn about this mission and all the amazing science that's involved. Daryl, back to you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Great launch and great job, guys. Back outside now to recap. An Atlas V rocket carrying Mars Perseverance rover launched on time from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station at 7.50 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Incredible. After the rocket took flight, it separated from the first stage and was then boosted into orbit by the Centaur second stage. Perseverance is now preparing for a second burn that will put it on a trajectory toward Mars that's just incredible to say. It gives me goosebumps. It really is. And we're so excited about that as well. And while we wait for that second burn, hang in there with us because we got a lot of exciting coverage to go. We're going to welcome in our one of our launch guests, Dr. Derek Muller. He is the creator and host of the popular science education channel on YouTube called Veritasium. He also holds a doctorate in physics education, so he's really smart. And that's why you saw us kind of having some fun because Derek was here on set. <laughs> We're just having a good time talking about this launch, which I got to start off with that, Derek. Your first time seeing a launch in person, what'd you think? I mean, <laughs> what can you say? I have nothing to compare it to, but it was awesome, something I will never forget, and I definitely want to be invited back. So uh, <laughs> if you guys can make that happen, I mean, just so amazing. You did a great job explaining physics. So what did it feel like? Kind of walk me through as you were watching and experiencing it. Well, <laughs> It, it's like all the physics goes out the window a little bit. It's a very visceral moment between you and this very powerful craft. I think it's just amazing all the, you know, the engineering that goes into making something that's that powerful and yet that controlled, you know? Yeah. And to witness that is phenomenal. And then to feel the rumble of all that sound as it hits you, I found it a, an incredibly emotional experience. It's it's almost unbelievable to you know see it taking off. It's it's very surreal. That's for sure. Nice. Wow. What what excites you the most about the Perseverance rover? Well, the Perseverance rover is going to do a lot of great science. So I'm excited. For example, that it's going to cache samples that we're going to bring back. You know, super excited that we're actually going to have samples from Mars in our hands. And I think that may clinch whether we can see that life is actually there. But I'm also super excited about uh, Ingenuity, about the helicopter, which I got to visit out at JPL before it was strapped to the underbelly of the rover. And to think about flying a rotorcraft in, uh, you know, another world, essentially, in a place that only has one one hundredth the Earth's atmosphere. Exactly. It seems audacious, yeah. and I am <laughs> impressed and amazed, and I, I can't wait to see if it works. You know, I, I am I'm cautiously optimistic. I think the team is, is phenomenal. And you did, a, in fact, a YouTube story on it, a piece on your channel, and did a fantastic job going to JPL. I did, yeah, and, and I was just so lucky that it was, like, there you know, a meter or two away from me on the other side of a door in a clean room. And uh, that was, yeah, one of, one of the great moments neat. of my life. Yeah, That thing's going to Mars. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and it, and it weighs like about as much as my laptop. Yeah. And you think about, 
you know, it, it's, you know, substantial in its size, and it's mm -hmm. going to go there and take off and fly all by itself, because, of course, we can't control it, mm -hmm. given the time delay and everything. I, like, that is, I just think, one of the pinnacles of, of human engineering. Yes, absolutely. Now, this is going to do some big science as well. What are your thoughts on the search for ancient microbial life on another planet, Mars? Well, you know, I think chances are good that Mars once harbored life. It was so similar to Earth in the past. One can only expect, you know, life probably sprung up there as well. But I'm, I'm really excited to, for us to get that confirmation because I think it really transforms our ideas about life and, you know, how, how frequent it is. Right now, all we have is this sample size of one, one Earth mm -hmm. with life, you know? Mm -hmm. We find another one that's 100% more information and data, and I think it's likely that that life will not be exactly like ours. And, and I think it'll be fascinating, everything we can learn about, you know, other potential forms of life just by finding, you know, life on another planet. You seem to suggest that you think there is life I, I do. I mean, you, you have liquid water for, I don't know how many, you know, half a billion or a billion years. On Earth, that was enough to create life. So, you know, the guess is that's not a unique thing, yeah. you know, right? I mean, I, the, the scientific hypothesis is you, you run that enough times, it, it's bound to lead to life again in, in other circumstances. Dr. Derek Muller, we really appreciate you being here, YouTube creator with the channel Veritasium. You, we know you have a two and a half uh, week old child uh, <laughs> that your wife is holding out. There's, there are very few things that I could leave for, but this launch, <laughs> that is one of them. Thank you so much for doing so. Get a selfie with our full-size rover back here. You see yes, that? Please. I definitely will. Very good. Thank you, Thank you so much. There has been a lot of anticipation by NASA teams leading up to this launch, but some won't be able to fully celebrate until the rover has safely landed on Mars seven months from now. Raquel, you are there with the Mars mission team at JPL in California. How are they reacting to seeing Mars 2020 take flight? Well, Moo, it's been quite an eventful morning with the earthquake, but you could feel the energy building in the room in the run-up to launch. And now I'm with Bobby Braun, the director for planetary science at JPL. Bobby, now that we've started our journey to Mars, can you tell me how you are feeling? Wow, it's just, it's a great day. It's, uh, we're all so excited um, and to, to get started in this way and to be on our way uh, after all this work that the team has gone through uh, it's really, really just fantastic. That's great. Now, what's now that Perseverance is off the launch pad, what are its next steps? Yeah, well, we're almost on the path to Mars, if you will. The launch vehicle is, has done great so far. Our partners at ULA are just fantastic, and we're very happy to be working with them and for them to give us this boost so far. Uh, but we still have to uh, have another burn of our upper stage. We have to pass through the night side or the shadow of the Earth come out on the other side and, and find the sun and power up and then uh, establish contact with the spacecraft. And once we do, we'll truly be on our way to Mars. We'll have a, a, a spacecraft that's power safe that we can communicate with and our journey will really begin. We look forward to that. Thanks, Bobby. Now, Daryl, as Bobby mentioned, there's an excitement here in the room as the team looks ahead to the second Centaur burn. But before we get to that, let's learn more about the science on board this rover. All right, thanks Raquel. And as you mentioned, there are numerous scientific studies and technology demonstrations on Perseverance. Some of these are directly preparing us to one day send humans to Mars. One in particular is called MOXIE. Jeff Shihai from the Science and Technology Mission Directorate is joining us now to explain, and he is here with us. He, yeah, well, you know, you know, a little, sometimes here at the a little difficulty with this technology oh, that's here, right. Daryl. Well, that's all right. It's a Britney Spears style mic, you know. It, <laughs> so like this. I don't okay. know if you're yeah, that'll work fine. We can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for making the adjustment there. So, Jeff, this is an incredible piece of technology here. This Moxie, mm -hmm. right? So, tell us what is it and why is it important? Well, Moxie stands for Mars. Oxygen Institute Resource Utilization Experiment. That's kind of a mouthful, so we grab a few letters out of there and just call it MOXIE. <laughs> and I, I think the name MOXIE has a certain kind of attitude that's appropriate for this <laughs> ambitious mission to Mars. But what in situ resource utilization is, is utilizing the resources that we find at a destination to produce useful commodities. And so what MOXIE is going to do is suck in the Mars atmosphere which is mostly carbon dioxide, and produce pure oxygen. Oxygen is a commodity that we can use in our exploration endeavors, and so um, 
Moxie is the first in situ resource utilization experiment ah. on another planet. How about that? So that's why wow. it's so important. If we can produce things we need at the destination, we don't have to load them in a launch vehicle, launch them from the surface to Earth, push them all the way to the destination, and land them on Mars or, or the moon. Yeah. Saving incredible weight, fuel, resources to exactly. use them, the ones that are there and in place. That's right, it took a lot of moxie. <laughs> <laughs> what were some of the biggest challenges in developing this technology, designing it, developing, building it? Well, the, the team that produced the hardware that we just saw the, being launched on its way to Mars, they, they certainly had moxie because they had overcome a lot of challenges <laughs> along the way. When, when you start to develop new technologies, you're working in a laboratory and you've got all the room you need usually. And you can build it big and heavy because you're not trying to make it look pretty, you're just trying to make it work. And you've got all the power you need and you can control the thermal environment and you can have people, teams of people come in and tinker with it and fix it yeah. when it breaks and all that. So, mm -hmm. but and you can probably see where I'm going with this. <laughs> when, when you get to the point where it's time to fly that hardware to prove it out in the space environment or uh, on the planetary surface, then the rubber really hits the road in terms of the engineering. And that's where the teams of engineers mm -hmm. come into play. And, and they develop clever solutions to implement the, the process that's been developed in the lab and package it for space flight. So Moxie faced a lot of challenges. You know, once you once you have to put it on the rover, um, the the size becomes important. Mm -hmm. It has to fit in a certain yeah. volume on yeah. the rover. The uh, amount of weight or the mass becomes mm -hmm. really important. Every ounce you uh, launch into space takes propellant to to move it. So yeah. uh, we want to make Moxie as light as possible. Had to fit within a certain mass budget, or mm -hmm. they would have kicked it off the rover. Yeah. <laughs> and we're glad you made it on the rover. <laughs> yes. And just real quick, in, 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 without getting too deep into the technical details, how does it convert carbon dioxide to oxygen? So Moxie uses a thermal and electrochemical process. There's a compressor that was built by a company called Air Squared. Some of that was funded under the NASA Small Business Innovative Research Program, actually. And uh, they built the compressor. What it does is acquire the, or the carbon dioxide from the Mars atmosphere and push it into the electrolysis system. A company called Ceramitech, a team led by a guy named Joe Hartvigson. Uh, they're now called Oxion mm -hmm. Energy, I think. But they, mm -hmm. they uh, built the guts of Moxie, which is the solid oxide electrolysis system that takes the carbon dioxide, CO2, actually pulls an atom of oxygen off the CO2, leaving CO. Oh, wow. And then those atoms migrate through the electrolysis system, and those oxygen ions are, are neutralized, and then they recombine, an O and an O becomes O2. Ah, and so we get yes. pure oxygen out of the system. That's fantastic. And so, in order for you to get Moxie on board uh, the rover, actually, you had to kind of clear through the very smart uh, lady to my <laughs> left. She's with Planetary Protection, so she actually had to clean off part of it, right? Yeah, yeah. You myself. had to heat it and then clean the, the That's ocean. right. Yeah, the socks part was actually self-sterilizing. It was hot enough so it cleaned itself, but there's a part, the O2 sensors, that needed vapor hydrogen peroxide sterilization. So it was the first time we used hydrogen peroxide on flight hardware. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. 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 So you can say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. Appreciate it. Very Thanks much. for letting us do that. <laughs> well, you know, in speaking about uh, the rover, uh, Moo, what is it, you know, Curiosity told us that we have, at, or had at one time on Mars, moving water. That's so, right. So what is Perseverance going to do in terms of uh, confirming whether life could have been there. Yeah, exactly. So the, the past mission set up the stage as far as understanding what could sustain life. And now we're actually looking for signatures of that life. And so some of the answers that you're looking for, which one are you personally looking <laughs> most forward to? Yeah, I, I'm personally looking forward to seeing non uh, uh, signs of life where no one will argue that it has a biotic source. Uh, it's very easy to say, oh, this chemistry could have happened from natural reasons, uh -huh. but I want to see a smoking gun. It would be awesome to see that. Now, that's not exactly easy, right? No, not at all. And so explain that, explain that to us. Yeah, so in order to get that definitive signal, one of the main things you have to do is make sure you have a clean instrument that you're sampling with. And so that's why we spent a lot of time cleaning, baking out hardware to such a high degree, 150 degrees Celsius for some of these parts to make sure it was clean enough. And so those parts have to be specially made to be able to handle that heat. That's right, yeah. In and order to get it past you. Yeah, all the material selection, everything was done specifically for that purpose. 
Where else in the universe, Mu, do you think we should explore for life? Yeah, I'm really excited about Europa. Europa has uh, an ocean underneath the, a thick layer of ice. It has vents underneath that have a heat source. So there's a source of energy for possible life. Europa, a moon. Yes, a moon. Yeah, icy moons. That's the next place to go. It's interesting that you picked that. I mean, it's a very, very cold, cold place. Yeah. Um, you've got a rover in front of you that is I miniaturized. Do. We have one that is behind us. Yeah. Right. And, and as part of this, you also had to make sure that that nuclear battery was installed. Exactly. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. This this bit back here. Tell me about how that worked, and when you did it, and and how that process was. Yeah. It was only a few days before this launch day. I mean, we we just finished counting our samples just a couple of days ago. How about uh, that? Yeah, so we had to actually alter the way we sample. We take wipes and swabs of every surface of the rover. But for this, we had to make sure our head was far back and we had as minimal radiation uh, impact as possible. But we got it. It was super clean. INL did a great job. Everyone has done a fantastic job making sure this was as clean as possible. It's ready to go. What do you think about that full-size rover behind us? It's incredible. It's like, yeah. hey, you should be up there. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently it is it is right to scale as you take a shot yes. of it there. That's a beautiful rover. Well, it is. It is. thanks for describing all that to yeah. us, Mo. We really appreciate the time to My you uh, for you uh, describing that. All right, back into the show now we go. Moving forward, of course, this is the countdown as we go up. You can see the Centaur there and the graphics as uh, we are tracking and continuing to track Mars 2020 on its way. And mm -hmm. when searching for the possibility of life on Mars, it's all about location, location, location. Mm -hmm. And Perseverance's destination is a place called Jezero Crater. Let's go back out to JPL now and Raquel, You've got a scientist there that believes Jezero Crater gives them the best chance of finding any evidence of past microscopic life. That's right, Daryl. Knowing where to look for signs of ancient life on Mars can be a daunting task. It took five years to select a perfect landing site. And with us now is Katie Stack Morgan, one of the project scientists who helped pick that location. Katie, can you tell us why we're heading to Jezero Crater? Thanks, Raquel. There are many reasons why scientists are so excited to send Perseverance to Jezero Crater, and why we think that Jezero Crater is an ideal place to begin a Mars sample return campaign. At Jezero, we think that Perseverance can assemble a diverse set of samples that will help us resolve some of the most important questions about life beyond Earth and the evolution of planets over time. At Jezero, we, we know without a doubt that there was an ancient lake and river delta. And at Jezero, we have river valleys that flow into and out of the crater, and we know that that lake filled up with water and then overflowed. Water, life as we know it, requires water to survive and thrive, and we think that Jezero has all the building blocks uh, to support past life. At Jezero, we also have one of the best preserved deltas uh, on the surface of Mars. And deltas in lake settings are ideal for supporting life. And the rocks that Perseverance will explore can tell us more about the, the possibility for past life on Mars. Um, the rocks at Jezero Crater are also some of the oldest on Mars, between three and a half and four billion years old. And that's the same interval of time when life was developing here on Earth. So by exploring the rocks in Jezero with perseverance, uh, we have the opportunity to explore more about the development of life in the solar system and can answer some of the major questions we have about that fundamental question. Back to you, Raquel. Great, thank you so much, Katie. And with that, let's head back to Kennedy Space Center, Daryl much Raquel we are back here at the Kennedy Space Center with our most special guest Mu <laughs> and the Perseverance rover here it is a full sky full scale mock-up of the actual rover itself well Mu here it is yes. and so we've learned a lot about this rover so far so tell me kind of Describe from top to bottom what we're working here. At the top, you've got yeah. the mass cam, which is pretty tall, it right? Is very it's tall. towering over your head. It is yeah. on a stage, but <laughs> what does it do? Yeah, so it has some a lot of fun components. Some of them are the mass cam Z, Z SAMs for zoom. So you see those two stereo cameras. Uh -huh. And there's also that eyeball, what looks like an eye, is actually a laser. It shoots at the rocks. A laser. And, a laser, <laughs> lasers. Uh, and then depending on the signature that comes back, the spectrometer reads it and tells you what the geology is. And that's fantastic. Yeah. Some of the real exciting science, though, is happening right here oh. on this part. This is the articulating arm that comes mm -hmm. out 
right? And then goes down onto the planet and starts drilling. Exactly. What all is here that's going to help us understand more about the geology of Mars, the climate, and whether or not there was life? Yeah, there's of course Pixel and Sherlock, the really amazing instruments that are mm -hmm. gonna tell us about the biosignatures. But in the middle, there is the coring drill. Um, the real drill will have a drill bit, a coring bit, which is hollow in the middle. And there's going to be a tube inside. This is just a 3D printed version. And as it's collecting samples, it's going to have samples that go directly into the tube. Oh, you've got a tube there. Yeah, yeah show, show that the camera 3D there. printed tube here. Yeah. And it's going to go down in the middle of the tube as it's acquiring the sample. Once it's done, it's going to dock with the bit carousel here. It's going to ingest the entire bit with the tube inside in the sample. It's going to rotate down to the belly and there's going to be a little arm on the inside called the shaw, the sample handling arm, to manipulate it, take pictures, uh, assess the volume, and then seal it. That's fantastic. And so there's quite a bit of robotics <laughs> happening between this part, the bit carousel, and getting it underneath. As yes. we know, it's now yeah. underneath. But here's a special guest, and we're going to duck that. down. This is the this is the Mars helicopter. Yes, ingenuity. And move. This thing is going to be actually tucked up on, underneath the rover. It was a late addition to this project, yes. but it's probably the neat, one of the neatest things on it. It is pretty amazing. 2400 RPM that these blades are going to spin That's in counter, fast. Uh, counter uh, directions. Yeah. It's a little bit under four pounds. It's super light, uh, and yeah, it's going to to be the first rotorcraft flight on the surface of Mars. It's spectacular. And, <laughs> and you know what's amazing? It will be taking pictures as well, right? That's Look right. The blades. Wow. These, these blades turn, Great right? Model. And they turn in opposite directions. <laughs> they I do. Understand. They yeah. do. It will have a camera on it. It will mm -hmm. shoot live or shoot video. Yes. That we will then get back. It'll shoot video of the rover as it's doing its work, right? Yeah, it's spectacular. And look at the clearance. I mean, it, this rover needs to clear this helicopter after it's deployed. All right, well, thank you so much for giving us the tour yeah. of the mock-up. It's just like the real one, yep. except for it's not going to Mars. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And so by now you may have heard that this Perseverance rover was named by a seventh grader. And it was given that name, which is very special to us. And so we asked Hidden Figures actress Octavia Spencer to tell you why the Perseverance name is more than just a name to us here at NASA. We are a species of explorers, believers. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. We are willing to do the hard things to overcome the many challenges. This is what brings out the best in us. We are go for a mission to the moon. Our path has led to success and to bitter losses. We come together today to mourn the loss of seven brave Americans. Yet, even when faced with tragedy and setbacks, we persevere. We keep striving. We keep believing. From space, we see our planet as a whole. We see the challenges facing it. And we face those challenges together. We will not give up. We challenge convention. We refuse to accept the status quo. The time at hand is hard, but we will persevere. We can still draw hope from the moon and the stars, from space, from exploration. There is a new day beyond the challenges we face now. Curiosity, insight, spirit, opportunity. If you think about it, all of these names of past Mars rovers are qualities we possess as humans. Ten, nine, we have ignition sequence start. But if rovers are to be the qualities of us as a race, we missed the most important thing. Three, two, perseverance. Launch, commit, lift off. We have lift off. We are species of explorers. We will meet many obstacles on our way to Mars. But as humans, we'll not give up. We will always persevere. Collective perseverance is what has gotten us to this day. And now Mars 2020 is on its seven month journey to Mars with an anticipated landing date of perseverance on February 18th, 2021. 
Now we are joined by Dr. Thomas Zerbuchen, Associate Administrator for Science at NASA. Dr. Z, thank you so much for coming over here. God, I'm so glad I'm here and I'm so relieved. You yeah. know, uh, we have a space mission. It, 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 uh, we're in touch with the spacecraft, you yeah. know, and mm -hmm. everything is nominal. We're waiting, of course, for the, for the, the second burn. But exactly. I'm not quite there, but we're really close. Yes. So can you tell us what makes going to Mars incredibly hard? So there's really two pieces that make it hard. The first one is what we're doing today, which is you really need to hit head in the right direction. Yeah. So take it off the Earth and have a lot of energy and head exactly in the right direction because what you want to make sure is in February when Mars comes, you want to be right there so you can get captured. The second one, which is the one that's going to make us nervous in February, <laughs> is to entry, descend, and land. You know, so. So the Mars atmosphere is almost the worst of all worlds. If yeah. it was really thick, you could do what we're doing on Earth, which is go in and with parachutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If there was none of them there, you could do you know, what we do at the moon. When in Mars, you have to do both on top of each other, which makes it 10 times harder yeah. than any of the other two. And so that's what makes it so hard. Wow. You've uh, devoted much of your life to science. And I know you were asked uh, the other day during a, a news conference, you know, uh, why another rover? And you gave a pretty impassioned response. Why is this rover important in your mind to the work uh, uh, that so many people are doing in science? So it's really kind of a key of a whole bunch of new research that we're doing that is focused on a question that for thousands of years philosophers have asked, scientists have asked, and we're ready to answer with the tools of science, which is the way to get reliable answers. And that is, is there life out there? We have, for 20 years, we've learned about the environment at Mars, and we're ready to ask that now. And, and the way we're doing it is with this rover. So it's really, for the first time in decades, the first astrobiology mission, we're ready for it. Where it's the next step, and and of course there's others coming. You know, uh, Dragonfly. Yeah. Uh, we're already thinking about, yeah. and you know, uh, other uh, missions. We want to, of course, go to Enceladus in Europa, you know, and really learn about life there also. Uh, so so it's an amazing first in that respect. And whether there's life there or not, that that's going to be the answer that we're looking for in these places. So um, the way, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so. We want to do a social media question yeah, real quick, if that's all right with you. Oh, yeah. absolutely. All right. We have a question from Twitter. What is the key difference between previous NASA mission, rover missions um, from, to Mars, like Spirit, Opportunity, Curiosity, and Perseverance rover? In what way is Perseverance unique from the previous ones? So there's a fundamental difference in the approach. Hmm. And the fundamental difference is that we decided to put the instruments mm -hmm on Perseverance, the best geology instruments on yeah. this. So we can find the right samples, and we decided not to put a chemistry lab on it. Mm -hmm. Guess why? We don't know which one yet. Mm. Ah, and so what point. we're doing is we're actually cre collecting the samples that we're going to bring to the best labs that are available to yeah. humanity, which are the labs all over the world. Mm -hmm. yes. And that's the choice here. And that's, of course, to do that, we need to do another first, which is humanity's first round trip to another planet. Yes. And that's what makes it different. We've got more with the launch operation to go, but real quick, how'd you feel about that launch? Oh, I loved it. It's like <laughs> punching a hole in the sky, right? Yeah. It's yeah. really getting off the cosmic shore, our Earth, into into wading out there into the cosmic ocean. I just, I just love it every time it gets me. All right, awesome. very good. Dr. Thomas Zerbukin, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you being here to explain all the science and the excitement that's coming up. Thank you thank so much. You. All appreciate right. it. Now we've talked to scientists and engineers and we have shared highlights of the mission and tech demonstrations that are central to the Perseverance rover. And folks, we have a lot more to share. Mars Perseverance has been flying in space for more than a half hour now. Let's check back in with Joshua and Mick to recap the flight so far and tell us what's coming up next. Hey, thanks, Moo. Yeah, as you're seeing on screen there, that is, again, the animation of the, the Centaur in motion around Earth, in orbit around Earth. Uh, and you can see there, like I mentioned, the animation being driven by real telemetry data. Um, Mick, how is, how is the report coming back from the first burn and then currently our coast phase? So we're hearing from Jesse Gonzalez and the engineering team is that everything so far has been nominal. Uh, Centaur's been performing well. All the settling firings have been going great, which is keeping the fuel that's still in the tank where it needs to be as we get ready to come up on main engine start two for that second burn, which is very important to get us our velocity and into that transfer orbit to Mars.
Yeah, so that will be up in just a few minutes. Uh, but I think we're going to actually send you back out to our main desk uh, to hear. Oh, so uh, sorry. I'm being held. Uh, we're going to hang out here. Uh, so, so coming up. So, talk about uh, C3, Mick. This is something that we talked about, <laughs> has, having to do with the the energy to leave Earth and and go somewhere else. We're talking about having to get to speeds over 25,000 miles per hour. That's Earth's escape velocity. Yes, yeah, so the C3 is basically just the technical term that we use in the aerospace industry to refer to the velocity that we need to get uh, uh, the vehicle where it needs to be. So as you said, we got that little over 2 million pounds of thrust that we left Earth this morning with, with those mighty four solids on the Dominator. I still like that from Tori <laughs> Bruno. Tor, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that one from Tori. But uh, we got off here and into the park orbit uh, with the proper velocity we needed. And then, of course, the second burn is so important for the velocity we need to get in transfer orbit. Awesome. So the Dominator punching a hole in the sky, <laughs> sky. as Dr. Zerbukin said. Uh, so we will send it back out now to the main desk and be back with you in just a minute to catch that second burn. Daryl? All right. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Joshua. Joining us now to talk about how special these missions are is Dr. Michael Watkins. He's the director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, which planned Perseverance's mission to Mars. That is my home center. <laughs> thank you for joining us, Dr. Watkins. <laughs> so we have so many great questions for you. Why are missions to Mars unique? Well, you know, I think they're they're unique for two ways. I and mean, one is just it's just Mars. You know, it's 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 been in our imagination for for centuries. You know, we, we it's a place that looks like the Earth. It looks like it could be home to us. It looked like it was once home to you know to to what could have been life. And and the fact that we can get there, we can get there every couple of years, and we can send missions, and we can build on those missions. And uh, you know, we you can learn from your mistakes. You can learn from your successes. One of the things I, I, I like to joke about is, you know, we, we say perseverance looks like curiosity, yeah. but the people who built them are the same. They look even more like each other. And so they, uh, you know, so a lot, a lot of our folks worked on Mars Pathfinder, they worked on Spirit, Opportunity, um, they worked on Curiosity and now Perseverance. And that, you know, that, that history, that, that, that group of folks, uh, they're, just, they're just world leaders and uh, it, it's why we're successful. So you oversee the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California and, and doing incredibly complex work. Why are these robotic missions so hard? You know, they're hard because you, you, you can't really see what's going on. You can't use your human responses, right? You know, you're used to driving your car and see what's happening and, you, and, and, and uh, you know, you turn the wheel. In this case, you know, we've got to tell the rover, we've got to prepare the rover to do a lot of that stuff on its own, right? And so we've got to understand Mars, we've got to understand how the rover works, and we've got to put all that together into a machine that can function more or less without us. Mm -hmm. So we talk to it once a day, and we say, you know, how are you doing, and go over there and, and do these experiments, and then it's got to do that. So, you know, we kind of give it its intention, mm -hmm. but then it's got to do all those activities by itself, and, uh, and that's a challenge. And the further away from the Earth you get, the harder it is. So you get out to Saturn, you get to Europa, you get beyond, and it becomes harder and harder. Yeah. Real quick, one question to wrap up. You've been in touch with uh, the folks out at JPL. On air, there was an earthquake that plat <laughs> played out. It was a 3.9 magnitude. How is everybody doing? How is your team? They're doing great. Uh, you know, our view was just it's just Pasadena. It's just the Earth being excited about going to Mars. <laughs> so it's a, it was a very minor earthquake. We have them a lot in California. Okay. Um, you know, maybe it's like hurricanes here or something. But yeah. uh, it's tropical storms here. But uh, it was a uh, it was a very uh, very minor event, and everything's fine. And uh, we were we are on our way to Mars. Okay. So a little rumble here in Florida. <laughs> yeah, some yeah, rumble exactly. in California <laughs> works out great. Mike Watkins, thank you so much. We appreciate you joining us on the broadcast. My pleasure. Thank you. Right. Awesome. We will have that conversation, a conversation with Zena Cardman coming up, yeah, which I'm astronaut. super excited about. That's right. Yeah. Uh, on the other side of the Centaur burn and spacecraft separation, we'll also highlight six major technologies that NASA is focusing on over the next decade, including the critical energy needs for such missions. But with that, let's turn our attention to the next operational steps. Joshua, are you there? Yeah, Moo, yeah, we're here and we're excited. Uh, we have a fuel pre-start call just coming in. Um, we are getting ready to hear the call for this second burn of that Centaur RL-10 engine. Um, again, Mick, explain what this second burn is for. So as we talked earlier, the second burn is really to get us that velocity as we head into that transfer orbit, right? Centaur and Mars 2020 will head into that solar orbit uh, on its way with the proper velocity. We will then uh, get ready to uh, uh, separate Mars 2020 on its way. And I'm hearing that uh, settling is done and, and we have main engine, main start, engine start. 
There we go. Awesome. And again, that animation there being driven by uh, actual telemetry data coming from that rocket. So that's a, a phenomenal ROM sign. Uh, look, uh, and it, again, I think that it's it's tough the with these burn. images. Uh, perspective and scale are so important. Uh, this vehicle yeah. is in Earth orbit. It's not near anything. So you can't see the acceleration of what's happening right now. But for eight minutes, it's going to be picking up speed. Yeah, this is this is the burn that gets us really moving in the direction we need to go, that, that fast velocity that we need to get out of our park orbit and head, our, head on our way to uh, Mars. Of course, Centaur and Mars 2020 are still uh, and the together. System is in and close uh, control we're hearing well. everything uh, is looking nominal on this fire so far. To, main engine start was, was good, and the, the seeing, uh, firing is, is going well, nominal, there. as we see in the animation there. Fantastic. Uh, so this is rocket science, and it's not easy. We actually want to bring in now, we have a special guest. This is Denton, G Dr. Denton Gibson, Doctor. excuse me. Yes. Uh, he is a rocket scientist. Uh, his official title is Senior, v Senior Vehicle Systems Engineer. Uh, Denton, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, did you enjoy that? Obviously, you got to kind of spectate. A lot of yeah, days, you guys uh, sitting on console, and, uh, you, you have to kind of focus on your computer, but you got to see this one today. Oh, yes, it, and it was a beautiful launch today. Yeah, nice sunrise. Hey, tell us about your role with LSP. Uh, I was not um, making up things when I said you're a rocket scientist, but what exactly do you do? So as, as our role in LSP, as a vehicle system engineer, we are the engineering team lead for a lot of the rockets that we launch our science missions on. And we are responsible for the oversight and insight into these launch vehicles from, for the NASA. That's awesome. And I know in the past you've supported a variety of vehicles. Tell us a little bit about the vehicles that you have supported and the ones uh, the ones you're focused on today. Yeah, so, so some of the vehicles I've supported in the past is the Delta II, who, which was a long-time workhorse for our science missions, as well as the Pegasus and Taurus slash Minotaur, Minotaur C. And right now I've been fo focused mainly on the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. Yeah, awesome. Um, so obviously not focused on the Atlas V, but a lot of that experience and the process is the same. Mm -hmm. I want to take a moment to pause and say Denton's there at Hangar AE. That's the NASA Launch Services yeah. Program's Hangar. They're very proud of that. Uh, we call it the telemetry center of the universe. That's where the data for today is flowing. Um, but I wanted to also ask you, uh, is the process the same for all these vehicles? When we talk about the telemetry and these sort of uh, processes of getting from Earth to Mars, uh, does, does Falcon 9 experience translate to Atlas or are they completely separate? So uh, the overall process for many of these launch vehicles are the same, whereas the, you, you ship stages to the launch site and assemble the launch vehicles by stages. So in that sense, they're the same, but there's a lot of differences between the launch vehicles that may change that process a little bit. But in general, the processes are the same. Yeah, and Joshua, I was going to say, uh, Denton, I work with Denton quite a bit over the years, and he, you know, he talks about the different vehicles he's worked on, um, but Denton is one of my senior vehicle engineers in LSP, and so although he's not totally supporting Atlas V today, he does have experience with Atlas V, and as, as he said, things are very similar. So using his experience, we're able to train and bring on new generation of engineers, and Denton's been a, a awesome. huge part of that to allow us to grow our uh, bench, if you will, to start working commercial partners. Yeah, awesome. So Denton, tell us a little bit about kind of what's involved, what goes in behind the scenes, what's the rocket science of going from Earth to Mars, this, this maneuver to go uh, into solar orbit. Yeah. So a lot of the things that happen behind the scenes are it's a lot of analysis work done by our analysis teams. I mean, it's months and months of analyses that are, that are performed based on the orbit insertion, um, the, the performance of the launch vehicle, a lot of modeling and simulations is done to be, be able to, to get to this point to where, where we can transfer from Earth orbit into solar orbit. Awesome. And uh, obviously, you're a rocket scientist. Um, that's for a lot of people. That's like the pinnacle. That's like, hey, I want to be a rocket scientist. <laughs> uh, so, where do you go from here in your career? Because obviously, like, I'm sure there's lots of things that you'd like to go and accomplish. So, you know, going from here, I mean, one of the coolest things of, about this job of working in the launch services program is working the launch, right? I mean, who, who doesn't love the launch and who we, doesn't love, love working launches? Yeah, we <laughs> love them. We love them. Excitement this morning, right, Denton? We, yeah. we got to see that's that's what it's all about. Oh, cool. So, you know, one of, one of the ideal jobs would be a launch director because you get to work all the launches. I mean, Very how good. cool is that? No, yeah, that's true. And and I guess you get to, uh, on some, is it right to say you call the shots or is it that the buck stops with you or how would you say that? Uh, I'd, I'd say the buck <laughs> stops with the launch manager. As, as, as today, we talked, right? Omar Baez is our launch manager for March 2020 and, and he had to poll the team and make sure everything's ready to go. So the buck does stop with him right there uh, on today's launch. And, and as Denton says, I think there's a lot of people that would love that job and Denton's 
Denton's definitely looking at that next step. So I guess we need to give Omar and his assistant launch manager, Tim Dunn, a heads up. Yeah, there you go. That, uh, Dr. Gibson. Dr. Gibson is Up on the coming. way. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, Dr. Gibson, before we let you go, give us a real quick snapshot. I know you have a mission coming up later this year. What are you working on? So um, so, so we're, we're, we're supporting the Crew-1 launch coming up. So we're helping commercial crew out with that one, as well as Sentinel-6 as far as the LSP missions um, that's coming up. Um, later on this year. And so we're excited about that one. Yeah, a ton going on. Dr. Gibson, appreciate you. Thanks. Uh, and I want to take a special moment on the commercial crew note uh, yeah, I, to I, comment. I, we've got a, a big day coming up. Yes. Um, pending weather. Um, there's a tropical system that might kind of yeah. get in the mix here. Um, but we have a tropical system that could create some problems. Otherwise, we've got Bob and Doug from Demo 2. They're coming home on August 2nd. Yes, I was going to say, Joshua, that's important for us also in LSP. Uh, Denton was my lead uh, VSC along with a, a few others uh, that are in the group that uh, worked that mission with the commercial crew program and so it's really important for us to be able to support other programs within the agency to to make these things happen as we as we launch mars 2020 today uh which is another step for us getting humans to mars right is uh getting humans launched off of earth soil was a huge step for um, off of American, American soil, soil yes. was uh, was a huge step for us. Yeah, and so talk about that really briefly with LSP. Obviously, Denton there, uh, appreciate him and, and his contribution, uh, and you working towards commercial crew, but also supporting Artemis, uh, which is a nut, which is also part of that path of getting humans to Mars someday. Artemis is about learning to live on the moon to sustain a presence there with the eyes on Mars. So how is LSP supporting even Artemis? Yeah, one of the things there is the gateway program, right? Deep Space Logistics that uh, is uh, working a lot of that. And so LSP is in the works of, of supporting Gateway and helping them work with the commercial partners that are providing the rockets for those kind of missions that are out there and future things. One of the cool things about working with the Launch Services Program is that we work with all of our commercial partners, SpaceX, United Launch Alliance, uh, Northrop Grumman Space Systems, and of course some up and comings. You may have heard it's some, a, right? It is like a growing Blue Origin. Field. Yeah. Um, it's definitely a growing field in the aerospace industry, and, and LSP takes pride in, in working with those commercial partners to figure out what we can do for NASA and the country. Awesome. Yeah, it is a it is an exciting time for spaceflight. The commercial spaceflight industry is booming. Uh, there's always new things happening. If you keep an eye on the news, you will see new things. Uh, we're getting word now that the the engine cutoff here should be happening momentarily. Once we see that happen, we'll have roughly, f I believe it's five minutes, until we actually see the spacecraft separation occur. So we're going to stay with you through that, uh, but want to kind of just preview that for you, that hopefully on screen here, you should be seeing that engine cutoff, and that's completely expected. That's that's a nominal operation, no, as nominal you say, We'll hear from Jesse Gonzalez, who's looking at the launch vehicle telemetry and, and watching the animation there. So uh, let's listen in for uh, Jesse call. here. And there's the call, and there's yep. the animation, again, uh, modified based on the data. So let's, let's talk about good. communication for a minute, Meg, because seeing. it is not an automatic thing to so just seeing, uh, shoot information at Earth and attitude. have that be usable. Uh, so how do we go about communicating not only through launch but on the way to Mars and then once we're at Mars? Yeah, so the important thing this morning is when we lifted off from, from Complex 41 here at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, we had ground stations that were looking at the launch vehicle and tracked it all the way to provide t uh, provide data. Once we got onto uh, orbit after uh, stage separation, you heard a call out for TDRS, uh, the telemetry network that, that NASA owns, uh, which, by the way, is also used for the ISS and will, yeah. be, will be used, uh, hopefully, for the landing with Doug and them. Yes. Um, so getting off the ground today was great because we could deconflict some of that TDRS usage, right? Um, but TDRS is very important for us to, to be able to get the telemetry from the launch vehicle back down to Earth here. And then, of course, when Mars 2020 separates and it gets on its way to Mars, then the JPL team will take advantage of NASA's Deep Space Network, um, which has been around for a long time, to be able to transmit uh, commands and data back and forth uh, to the Mars 2020. So it takes a lot of folks to work those, and, and the TDRS and Deep Space Network are very important to not only the science missions, but human space flight also. Yeah, and I think the coordination of that is something that people don't get a chance to understand much, because as you said, we're using TDRS for crew return, we use TDRS for space station, and TDRS is is not an unlimited resource. We have a, a good number of TDRS satellites in orbit that help us do these things, but it is a coordinated effort across 
the globe, um, because we even have ground stations in Australia, I think. Yeah. Where are all of our ground stations even? We, we have ground stations everywhere, not only here in America, on the West Coast and East Coast, but then you get into uh, South Africa area. Uh, Australia, you said, we have uh, several ground stations that catch up different things uh, for missions. But, of course, in orbit, TDRS and the Deep Space Network are very important. And as you said, there's not an, there's not an unlimited amount of resources there in the TDRS Network. So we well, have to coordinate those things within again, the NASA morning. agency um, and with our commercial partners when they're used for our, uh, for our summer camp. And, and uh, Jeremy again, Carty, another part he's actually been doing most of our live NASA streams, uh, as, if you've been watching any of the uh, new Yeah, so um, uh, new just on that note, and, uh, kind of thinking about around the world, of, uh, currently uh, this spacecraft is roughly of, over uh, the South Indian Ocean. Uh, so that's uh, just thinking about Jeremy's how fast we're moving. And he needs uh, just, to, uh, just the amazing... Uh, world of space flight. It's just hard to put it in words here, so, uh, like, we're, we're Thanks again for watching. It's great to, uh, to have you join us. And, uh, um, and so we'll uh, talk actually let you know about any future life streams. We're still working on trying to get some, uh, some more Friday night uh, programs uh, going. And um, working to protect and who knows uh, from what other things we can come up with. So uh, thanks for staying connected to Copernic. And if you get a chance, if you haven't done it already, go to Southern Tier. It's a combined team. ULA, JPL, Southern Tier Tuesdays dot com website and vote for us. For that, about uh, a minute, right? One of the things Take we talked earlier is that Centaur and Mars 2020 are on the same.